Fred? Oh, you're on mute. And I think I'm on mute too. No, no, you're on mute. Okay, so I'm now not, I can not hear on you. mute now. Okay. Yes, now I can and hear you. Got got some people joining us. I'll bring up the note well and be ready to share it. Hello, Ron. Hello, how are you, Jim? Good, good. How are you doing? Okay, let's go back to the screen and see what everybody looks like. You still look the uh, same after lockdown. Thank you. I'll take it as a compliment. <laughs> uh, we all grew beards, gave ourselves haircuts. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so, like, so what do I need to do when I will be presenting? Do I need to share my screen? Yes. Uh, You'll need to share your slides. Uh, if that's your screen, so be it. Okay. I'm, I'm sharing my screen. Okay, I've got the note well ready to share. Oh, uh, okay. Go ahead so and put it up today. if you would. What's that? Go ahead and put it up if you would. Okay. Um, I don't see Ben. Has Ben joined? Uh, I don't think yet. Oh yeah, why I'm showing up as an energy research group? Yeah, once WebEx believes that it knows who you are, it's almost impossible to make it forget. There. So what 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 can I do with all my multiple personalities? Sybil. It's a Sybil attack. Uh, there, can you see the note well? Yeah. I can see the note well. Okay. Um, uh, Fred, I'm Chung Feng. Hi, Jordy. Hello. I'm always amazed to see what people look like during uh, lockdown. You know, who's given themselves a haircut, <laughs> who's grown a beard. <laughs> well, what? California emerged from lockdown and is busily sliding back into it. So. Yeah. But actually, actually, it's the same if you see the people face to face every three or four months, right? Uh huh. Yeah. We have to ITF. <laughs> but now it's been six months. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But yeah. I mean that normally you have the same thing. Uh, has yeah. the guy cut he, he, his hair or changed his look or whatever every four months? <laughs> I'm going to take this down so I can see what people look like. Okay, Jen. Um, yeah. I don't see Ben yet. I was expecting him to be the first speaker. Um, you should probably have your slides ready in case uh, he doesn't materialize. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm almost. Always ready, actually. Uh... Let's see here. 
Ron, is there a way to record this? Yes, there is. Hang on. I will figure yeah. it out. Actually, it said recording in progress, no? Um, yeah. So, okay, I guess we're recording. Um, we don't need a Jabber scribe since everybody is remote. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, do we have a minute taker? You can record the session. What's that? You can record the session. Better minutes than recording the session? Well, we do that all the time anyway. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the problem with using a recording as minutes is you can't scan, set, scan and say, oh, the person said this. You have to go listen to the whole recording. Yeah. 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 Warren says we still need a minute taker. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking for a volunteer. We have 30 people on the call. Uh, who, who's willing to take minutes? Don't all speak at once. Let me start looking for volunteers. Okay. Noah, would, would you be willing, Noah? Noah, you're on mute. Ah, oh, Ben's here. Uh, my work here in Salaam, Tanzania is a bit slow. Um, so do you need to turn off your video? Is that what you're getting at? Uh, my video is actually turned off. Oh, can can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, I can hear you, Noah. Would you be willing to take minutes? Okay, okay, he might have a connectivity problem. Do we have anybody else who'd be willing to take minutes? Scott, would you be willing? This is Warren, I can do it. Okay, thank you. Um, it is now four minutes after the top of the hour. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, and Ben, uh, can you share the slide from uh, there? Let me stop sharing. By the way, this is the well noted well. A quick question. Do we have a WebEx link? That's not a WebEx, a uh, Etherpad. Um, sure. Do you, do you want me to email it to you or what? Or stick it in the chat. Or um, I can just take notes on my own machine. Just if it's an Etherpad, people can, you know, fight and make them better. Okay. Well. Hello? Uh, sorry, guys. 
my question is a bit uh, unstable. Uh, somebody who's perhaps volunteer, if that is okay. Sure. Uh, could you volunteer perhaps? Uh, sorry. So, oh. uh, can everybody hear me? I can hear yes. you. Okay, so we see your slides again. Um, please feel free to, to, to talk to them. Uh, you can let me know if we can start now. You can start. All right, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. So, this is uh, my presentation. Uh, my name is Ben, and I'm uh, with the Research and Education Network for Uganda. So I want to present uh, our case scenario for IPv6 deployment. I will do a little bit of introduction about uh, RENU, which is a Research and Education Network for Uganda. RENU is the NREN that uh, operates in Uganda, and we are uh, basically mandated to give ICT support and services to such institutions, uh, academic institutions, tertiary institutions, and uh, some para government parastatals. So uh, it started way back in 2006, but the network kicked off in 2014. And by then, we only had one point of presence that was in Kampala. And we started with one member institution, so one point of presence, one member institution. But currently, we, the network spans across the entire country with uh, six points of presence. Uh, and then we have also six uh, different aggregation points where different members connect. So with all this, we have about uh, over 200 members now connected on the uh, research network. So among us, these 200 members, we have about uh, eight members uh, speaking uh, V6 or being able to use V6 right now. And uh, some challenges that I'm going to be sharing with you uh, have led us to have some of these members not connecting, but um, we are working on it. So I'll just give you an overview of what a network looks like. Um, in simple terms, we have uh, a purely uh, fiber optic network that's from the backbone and also the access technology. Uh, we don't have a uh, microwave, but microwave is in the future. And it's something we are looking at because there are areas which are hard to reach with fiber to micro, uh, microwave. Um, at the access level, basically the most of the technologies we're using, uh, we have uh, VRP, VRRP, which is basically helping us to do with switching between uh, links or access links for the institution on the backbone. So every member basically has two links. So that means their access is backed up. They connect to different points of presence. And uh, we are happy for uh, being able to switch. So we use also v BFD with static routes, which helps us to detect basically failures uh, on different access links. And then obviously we have some members who are able to speak BGP with the NREN. So we also have BGP attacks. Uh, in the backbone, like I said, we have six points of presence across the country. And basically we are running ISIS within the entire backbone and BGP and also RSVP protocol signaling. So basically ISIS has been, was one of the, advantages that we had when we started to roll out IPv6 because 
moment we didn't need to create another instance uh, in case like we're using OSPF or something. We basically just had to define depending on the INET families. And that was uh, a big advantage for us when we're starting out IPv6. So uh, basically, if you see from my diagram on this side, uh, the network is purely a dual stack network. So we have each member, this is a representation of a given member. We give IPv4 and IPv6 in their land. They connect to us over IPv4 and IPv6, and also the backbone is purely uh, dual stack. Um, we have two forms of uh, server installation. We have the Renu Cloud, which is an open stack. And you can see in my presentation, this is currently only version of IPv4. I'm going to speak about this later on in my presentation. The other servers we have, which are running on the Ganeti um, software for it, uh, able to support dual stack. So these are dual stacks. And this is basically the highlight of how a network is laid out. All right, so with our dual stack technology that we're using, we, we have had a couple of advantages that have helped us basically to, to execute this and to reach where we have reached. So I, I would like to start by talking about the boosting points. Basically, the management has been able to train engineers. Uh, that means the NREN engineers and also the institutional engineers. This has helped us to be able to support it we understand. So it's one of the things that has helped us to be able to roll out to the point we are. And then also the other advantage is that we have IPv4 within our backbone. So we are not doing nothing anywhere in the backbone. Basically the backbone is running on version four public IPs. So this was a big advantage to us, meaning that we are not going to have to do a lot of uh, uh, maybe not v4 to v6 nothing and all the other stuff so it helped us also to move smoothly and also the isis instance i already explained this then within the research and education network we have what we call the direct engineering assistance program so this is where um the NREC sends a cohort engineering to a given mission so what we do there is we try to make the network of a given institution better by by cleaning out all the bottlenecks, deploying services that we see benefit the institute. That means we have an advantage to be able to deploy IPv6 during the direct engineering assistance. And this is how we have been rolling out IPv6 to different institutions. We train them and we are able to give them all the need to support it. And we hand it over to them for um taking over after that. And also the other advantage you've had is that we have had a, an equipment donation support from the NSRC because among the such challenges that we've been facing, many member institutions don't have equipment that is capable of supporting IPv6 and they don't have the budget for it. So this has helped us to address. All right, uh, so I'll shift to the side of the challenges that uh, mainly we are, we are facing right now. Um, when we rolled out IPv6 um, and then the member institutions were joining the network and joining, it, it, we faced a challenge with uh, incapable mode because at the moment we were running Juniper MX5s within a backbone and these could not support the full routing table for v4 and also for v6 so we, were, we had to reform and uh, we solved this by by sending the uh, default route to to the smaller routers and then we are able to acquire bigger juniper mx 480s which are now acting as routers within the backbone so we have two Juniper mx 480s which are strong enough to support both routing tables and then Within the smaller um, backbone routers, we send the default route. So 
this is uh, what I call the cost of real stack. You have to be able, uh, you have to be able to, to to have nodes which can support both routing table if you're going to use a full routing table all the way to the access level. Then the other challenge that we faced during uh, our deployment was to to be able to have a unified bandwidth policy for both IPv4 and IPv6 for a given particular member institution. So when we did roll out IPv6, we found out that actually um, a given member institution was able to do twice the capacity they subscribe for. So uh, we solved this by doing uh, per policy, uh, per protocol policy, whereby we have filter applied to the version four and also the version six for that given particular institution uh, bandwidth. And then this works fine. So the whether they are V4, whether they are coming in V6, they will still use the same given capacity they subscribe for. They will not be able to do twice that. Uh, and then also uh, the legacy nodes that are within the institutions which do not support IPv6. So we face this a lot when we are rolling out IPv6 in different institutions. So you find the, the core equipment they have at the back of their network cannot support IPv6. They need a, a license to actually um, be able to to support V6 so and they cannot afford the license. So this is, has also been a big, big hindrance to many member institutions. And then the other I talked about is the adoption uh, within open stack. That is now for our cloud instances because we provide the cloud service to member institutions whereby they are able to come and they get uh, different VMs, all they need. We are hosting websites within the same uh, cloud service instances. So these need to be on, on both V4 and V6 for, for better support. But with the current version of OpenStack that we are running, which is version 11, it cannot support IPv6. And we are looking at having to upgrade it in the near future so that we are able to have a cloud for the stack. Then the, the last challenge that we are facing at, at the moment is most of the CDNs at the internet exchange point actually uh, only giving us IPv4. So you find that our member institutions who are on V6 do not have the same experience as the people who are on V4 because uh, uh, rather, sorry, the, the, the CDNs at the exchange have, are not yet, have not yet turned on the IPv6. We are only getting V4 traffic mostly from, from the exchange. So those are mainly the challenges we are facing right now and some we've been facing that we've been able to work around uh, in different ways. So I will talk about how we, 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 we've we been trying to see that we pick up, we pick up my institutions to actually start um, rolling out V6 within their network because of IPv4, which they may feel this is enough, but. We've done a lot of intensive training for the engineers to actually give them the skills whereby they are ready to support the network even without the NRN engineers. They can really stand alone with it. So first thing is we did a lot of training for member institutions. So when the engineers and the institutions are able to appreciate IPv6, its importance and why it's here, then we go ahead and do the deployment with them. So we help them through what we call the direct engineering assistance or the DEA. So we help them with IP planning, we help them with setting up DNS and DHCP and all the other aspects so that they're able to actually support the network. Then also through um, different partners like NSRC, we get some equipment which is capable of doing better routing for V6 and V4. So we also do the donation to given members. And this of course is not, uh, enough to cover the growing number of patients, but we keep on pushing and pushing. So uh, we do donate the person this donation received from NSRC to the different institutions, and they are able to also um, join the, the, the V6 network easily. Yeah, so when we look at more work that we are planning on doing besides um, making sure that our, our open stack is able to support V6, which is going to be upgrading to a better version, uh, which V6. We also want to work at uh, gathering our measurements so that we can have proof of success. And this is still
still going on with our and different different data and statistics are being gathered we are by at the end of the, the day we can to actually produce statistics which can show uh, our progress and go forward progress thank you so at this moment uh i'll come in comments and thank you okay thank you ben um so could you go back to the slide of the issues that you see, the, the challenges that you're experiencing? Um, are there any of these that we can address in the IETF? Doesn't really look like it. Now, OpenStack has had um, has had IPv6 capability since the Neutron release, uh, which I think was 2015 or thereabouts. Um, are you finding other users that that also are using uh, IPv6 in OpenStack? Ben? Uh, not sure of other users, but uh, I know that newer versions of OpenStack actually can support both IPv4 and IPv6. It's a, a hindrance that we're using at the moment, a lower version. That's what we are still reading around uh, deploying or migrating our cloud to a, to a newer version of OpenStack, which can actually support uh, both protocols. Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, okay, does anybody, I would love to have the feature that we have in Zoom, which allows me to, allows people to raise hands. I don't see that in WebEx. So if, if you, I'm sorry? Hmm? You're not. Okay, someone is speaking in Chinese. I, I don't understand. Um, so if you want to do the equivalent of raising your hand, uh, please drop a note in the chat room. And would everyone who's not speaking please go on mute? Uh, the, the noise seems to be coming from Olivia. Uh, I don't know if the host can mute them. Okay, I muted Olivia. Um, well, okay. Uh, I don't see any questions coming up. So uh, the equivalent of the chat room. So, um, or uh, the raise hand feature. So let's move ahead to, uh, to Jen. Uh, so, so that means, Ben, that you need to stop sharing. Okay. okay. Am I supposed to share content? Oh, beautiful. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, now. Can you see the slides? Yes, you broke the treadmills. I did, no spoilers yet. So, hello. I'm going to talk about unicorns, about something which many people consider being impossible nowadays. I'm going to tell you a story about converting at least part of an enterprise network into IPv6 only mode. Uh, obviously, some people might ask, why would anyone in 
why would any sane person ever do that? Well, I had plenty of reasons. First of all, we actually managed to run out of private address space. Yes, it's possible. Secondly, we're getting an increasing number of requests from various uh, developer teams for IPv6 only environments because they need to use it for testing, for dog fooding, to make sure their products work in v6 only mode. And last but not least, I realized that actually operating dual stack is hard. It's not news actually, right? So, and I'm big fan of not multiplying entities without necessity. And obviously running two protocols on every single host is actually not a necessity anymore. So, what we actually did to prove that it's possible and the sky is not going to fall, we looked at the low hanging fruit. We looked at our guest network. And our guest network consists of two parts. First, it's a guest wireless, the one our visitors using, and actually all non corporate devices are connected to. And it's actually quite a big one. More than half of all wireless devices connected to our enterprise network is connected to guest one. And we also have a wired network, which is used mostly as a fallback network for all unauthorized devices connected to wired. And as a result, that network was actually using a lot of IPv4 address space because we need to a provision for scenario when no devices could authorize. Uh, but normally it's heavily underutilized in terms of using address space. So we decided to uh, use this as a proof of concept. Design elements. Uh, as far as I know, the only way to actually turn off IPv4 on an end host is to use NAPTX4 with a combination of DNS6 for mostly. Our guest network already uh, was using Google Public DNS as DNS server, so we just changed it to Google Public DNS64. And we configured NAT64 on the same edge devices which are used for NAT44. It uh, will simplify the traffic flow, so all traffic taken the same path doesn't matter what protocol it is. And we are not using any form of DHCP, so all configurations happened uh, via Slack. So DNS servers were provided via RDNS. Simple, easy. So, first, indeed, we had to do a pilot. And the goal of the pilot was to answer a number of questions. First of all, I need to know what percentage of users actually need IPv4. Would it be 50%, 25%, 5%? And as a result, how much of address space I can reclaim? Because we were really, really, really need to reclaim some IPv4 address space to reuse it. Also, you don't know what you don't know, so it would be very interesting to find out what kind of applications would fail and would it actually affect the business processes. And another point which was raised, and it was actually a big concern for some people, what would be impact on the support line? Would our IT support infrastructure just melt because it will be an avalanche of angry customers, or probably nobody would notice? So we selected a number of pilot sites. Oh, well, I guess every network would have their own criteria. And for me, the main uh, criteria uh, was the presence of network operations team because troubleshooting would be much easier when you have people on site. And then we looked at sites where we have a large number of devices to ensure we have enough variety of end hosts and applications. And I kind of cheated and I looked at sites where uh, customers already requested a TV6 only network, which would mean I already have early adopters willing to try, willing to use it and report issues. And I also made them happy by giving them what they asked for. So, as I said, we had wired and wireless network, and we actually did pilot slightly different. For wired, it was easy. We just change our DNSS, turn off IPv4, but the thing is, we had no idea what people plug there, because it's by definition, it's a network for third-party unauthorized devices. 
So we did not want to break things for users. So what we did, we gave them a portal where the user could go and request IPv4 to be enabled back. So basically the switch port was moved to a dedicated VLAN for this. And users were not forced, but were encouraged to open a ticket and report why they did that, because I wanted to enumerate all issues and find out what kind of use cases we have for enabling IPv4 for guests. Well, obviously I did break something right away, and it was actually the biggest issue of the whole project, seriously. High priority tickets, people were very unhappy because I broke those devices. Apparently, a lot of people want to watch YouTube and Netflix while ex exercising, and turning off IPv4 took away that capability. I didn't even know those devices need to be connected to network, but anyway. Well, it was easy workaround. We enabled IPv4 back for them, and we're actually talking to a vendor to see if they could fix this, because I looked inside as a kind of very old Android, so I guess eventually they should just upgrade a version and it will get IPv6, but we'll see. So, what did we find after the wired gets piloted? First of all, we found out that most of our sites do not need more than a few IPv4 enabled guest ports, fortunately, except for sites when we have gym equipment, because yeah, in this case, we need enough IPv4 address space for every exercise machine, which is connected to the wired network. As a result, we reclaimed a lot of IPv4 address space, basically all of it, most of it, because we ended up giving like slash 27 per site, which is nothing peanuts comparing to what we used to have. And we found two primary use cases for enabling IPv4. First of all, it's a kind of embedded system special devices like IoT type stuff, which yeah, obviously is a kind of behind in terms of IPv4 support. But another very uh, common uh, use case is a scenario when user connecting a router, a CP to the virus port. So what happened in dual stack segment, right? Users have a cheap CP, plug it to the wired guest segment, and voila, the user has a, its own private testing network because the CP is just getting private IPv4 address and using NAT44 to so that address and for us, it's just a normal host connected to a network. Now, I came and took away IPv4 from the segment. What obviously happened, the CPE cannot get IPv4 address, so it could not do any translations for IPv4 traffic, because actually it could have done it if it enabled 464 slot, right, on this interface. Unfortunately, I was unpleasantly surprised that a lot of CPs, at least once our users uh, have, do not enable 464 slot or don't even support it. So one of our primary use case, and this is actually a great success story, was that we have a kitchen equipment, kind of smart scale from LeanPass, and those devices actually have a small router inside, and that's why they broke, right? So that router, even after they added support of IPv6, like getting IPv6 address and getting DNS via RDNSS, they still needed to do something with, the, with that a private VLAN behind the router. So this is how layer violations look in uh, nowadays. I had to use a screwdriver to enable IPv6 on that device, which yeah, I, see, I still think it's a layer violation. So. And actually, they fixed it for us. So now our kitchen equipment is capable of doing 464 slot on their uh, upstream interface, and they work uh, fine on uh, IPv6 only network, at least uh, the testing uh, equipment, which I have at my desk. So this actually proves that if you talk to your vendors, you might actually get things fixed. So, question actually, I looked at the router requirement and I found it a bit confusing. If you look at the router requirement RFC, it doesn't even mention 464X slot as a transition technology. If you look in IPv4 as a service router requirements RFC, it does mention 464X slot, but 
I found it not easy to find because when you start looking for outer requirements, you first come in after 7084. So I am just curious, are we doing like good job on making clear that routers should support 44X slot when the uplink interface doesn't have IPv4? Because I think it should be reasonably easy for a router to detect. It could do 7050 to find the prefix, or it could use uh, array uh, NAT64 option to discover the network is V6 only. And I think the user's life would be much more easier if routers just automatically enabled 464X slot on upstream. So, Wi-Fi, the biggest network, as I said, so we did not want to upset users, so we did it in baby steps. First, we uh, did opt-in phase for like, about a year. We created a dedicated additional SSID, and we sent emails to users asking them to join that network, try it, and tell us what does not work. And then, after we became reasonably confident that we can do that, we actually made our primary guest SSID V6 only, but again, to provide users with some form of fallback mechanism, we create a dedicated fallback SSID. In both cases, again, we asked users to report why they fallen back to dual stack SSID, why, what does not work. So, pilot results. Well, during phase one, we found that, yeah, it's hard to ask users to do something, right? Most of them do not read emails, so ignore them, or they just do not care. So we actually got about 10% of users moving to a new SSID onto our request. And because we actually asked them to report bugs, we uh, tried to motivate them. So it was a kind of lottery system. Every time you report a bug, you're entering for a, for a kind of raffle, and as a result, like, $200 were donated to a charity of the winner's choice. And as a result of this, we got about 15 bugs reported, and three of them were immediately, like in the matter of months, fixed, which demonstrated that we probably should be reasonably good to go and make IPv6 uh, only as a primary mode for guest network. So, phase two result, what happened when we made IPv6 only uh, uh, guest network primary. Surprisingly, less than 5% of our users fall back to dual stack one. So uh, probably because most of those devices are actually mobile phones, right? They do work quite well on IPv6 only. So how many of them is an absolute number? So we got about 25K peak device count on V6 only network and simultaneously individual devices in different devices. It was pre-COVID, obviously, yeah, because now we have less people in the offices. So actually quite a lot, I would say. Again, not so many bugs reported. And because now more users notice that something might not work, we got four other applications fixed. So we're making it better and better. So probably when you start enabling IPv6 only for your users, uh, at least some applications will be already fixed for you. So, remember those questions we wanted to answer as a pilot? So, the my most important question, what percentage of our users need IPv4? As I said, about 5% of them explicitly fallen back. So they were on the on V6 only SSID, but for some reason they fell back. Actually, we had another 10%, which were constantly sitting on the special 2.4 guest SSID, which were sharing the same network segment with the uh, uh, guest one. And we intentionally did not touch 2.4 SSID because we assumed that if device is old enough for not being able to use 5 gigahertz, it probably would not work very well on V6 only. So in total, we have 15% of users staying on dual stack, but it's really hard to find out where all those 10% of two, uh, users on 2.4 are coming from, because I suspect that some of them just <coughs> randomly connect to some SSID. So maybe some of those devices actually could be on V6 only. And for Jen, let me interrupt you a moment. Um, yeah. 
We have a question in the chat room. Are the numbers you're giving out for Wi-Fi only or are they wired as well? So, uh, this is Wi-Fi. This is Wi-Fi. Because for wired, we do not have many devices there normally. We would have a lot of them if our radios failed and we would not have dot one x working. But we do know that most of our workstations would work on V6 only, at least in the guest network, at least in the emergency mode when while we're using radios, right? For wired, we had, I would say, a top of my head, we're talking maybe about 1,000 devices in total migrating to V6 only. But uh, most of users are obviously sitting on wireless, yeah. So 25K simultaneous devices at peak time on Wi-Fi, V6 only. This is what we saw. Does it answer the question? Um, he says yes. Okay, thanks. So, for wired, again, we have very few devices uh, count. Yes, I say it's normally either like special IoT devices or users plug in CP CPUs without 464 flat support, except yeah, for places when we have gym. Utilization as a result. What we observed is that utilization on pilot sites for DHCP before pool dropped between like five, eight times, which actually correlates very well with those like average 15% of users staying. 5% falling back to dedicated fallback SSID, 10% using 2.4 SSID. So yeah, 15% of users still utilizing our IV4 address space. So as a result, we were able to be conservative. We basically reclaimed 75% of our address space initially allocated for guests. And for Wired, yeah, we, allocate, we reclaimed a lot because, as I said, we initially had to provision enough address space for every single device in the network to Wired device to fall back to Wired, I guess. And now we don't need this. We just provide slash 27 per site for those special use cases, and that's it. Well, what doesn't work? Actually, I'm supposed to publish, I have a small website I'm supporting, to publish the full list of external stuff, which does not work, but I have not done it yet. Those, I have maybe about 25 open bugs currently in my like known issues tracking list. Those top five, and actually I think there is a big gap between top five and the rest of applications in terms of number of complaints. Obviously, exercise equipment. Be careful if you have network connected gym devices. They do need, need IPv4. Secondly, oh, biggest one, second biggest one, everyone who uses Spotify, please go and click on this link and upload the request. Because Spotify application on laptops, application, it works if you're using it in the browser mode, but application itself doesn't really work very well last time I checked on V6 only. And the, the way Spotify fixes the issue is that you open an uh, issue there and it waits and they wait for community to come and upload it to so, uh, demonstrate it's important. Yeah, obviously, third-party VPN system. And actually, most of them do not work just because the remote side did not enable IPv6 on the VPN concentrators. And actually, one of them, one of those companies our people connect to, actually fixed it for us. And some of them, yeah, now considering fixing it. So normally, there is no, like, protocol issue, it just, does your VPN vendor support it? Yeah, I got a lot of complaints about StarCraft not working. And actually, I think Steam does not let you sign in on IPv6 only as well. So online gaming is a big thing, but we did not consider it to be a deal breaker and business critical, sorry. Also, Mac OS internet recovery image, anyone from Apple? Around? I actually heard that this thing is going away. Soon, but yeah, I think devices will be using internet recovery, which will be around for a while. So this this wasn't a big issue for us because it's provisioning things. You can use dual stack SSID uh, for provisioning and then uh, go back to V6 on the primary one. But still, it's one of this uh, provisioning things which does uh, require V4. So, Jen, we have another to, yeah. question in the chat room. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> Why do you think IoT is the main IPv4 use case? IoT uh, seems well, like it would need more addresses and so would really want to use V6. It was my impression as well, but I like I'm saying I'm saying about what I observed, right? All those maybe maybe I shouldn't be saying IoT, but actually yeah, sensors were a problem. So basically all this like a metal system, everything which is not laptop but has a kind of uh small a network interface, but com computing is not its primary thing. I was having issues. We had building management system, like some smart smart bulbs, and all this like stuff. At least uh, things we were using was not really supported V6. And every time you talk to those people, like when you put a APV6 as a requirement and RSP, they were like APV6. Oh my God, why? why? Do you do you really have IPv6 enabled? And I'm like, yeah, we have IPv4 turned off. So I was surprised as well. I don't know why it is like that. I guess because of the usual chicken and egg problem. Everyone was connecting those things to IPv4 networks, so they happily use IPv4. So this needs to change, right? We need to put this as an RSP. We don't go and replace those devices because they don't have IPv6, but uh, the goal is at least to start getting new devices which have IPv6 support, right? So yeah, I don't know. I don't know why they don't have IPv6 support. It's just a reality, at least uh, what we have uh, So dedicated fallback network. We actually usually hope that maybe we do not need dedicated uh, fallback mechanism for Wi-Fi, and we can use 2.4 SSID as a fallback. But we realize now it might not be desirable. So what we ended up doing for the wired network, how it works now post pilot, users could not do just self sign in and request IPv4. They need to file a request. That request will be reviewed and usually approved, but it's a temporary exception. We tell the users we give you IPv4, but it's for 18 months. We can extend this, but we need to see an exit strategy. We need to see that you talk to a vendor and request IPv6 at least in the next release or next iteration of the hardware. Because otherwise, if you just give users IPv4, they would never uh, start fixing anything. And yeah, upon that request uh, is filled, yeah, we just moved our uh, port to dedicated dual stack VLAN. For IP, for Wi Fi, we ended up having a dedicated uh, dual stack SSID. But I do not think it's the best strategy, and I will be back to this why in a few slides. Showstoppers. Well, surprisingly, no, especially if you do give users a mechanism for fallback, right? Again, it does depend on your network environment, on type of devices you have. Your experience may vary. Mobile devices mostly just work, right? If you have mobile phones, good. If you have laptops with millions of other applications, it might be a completely different story, actually. So, yeah, you need to try it. It worked very well for us, surprisingly. Oh, impulse on support team. Very low, actually, almost none. But we did something to make it happen. The key thing is to plan ahead, right? You need to work with them in advance to make sure they're not getting overloaded. First of all, we were letting users know about the change. We were telling them, okay, guys, you might not understand what it is, but it's coming. And we also, in that notification, we told them what to do if something does not work, just to uh, minimize impact on support team. Also, we worked with our first line support. We gave them troubleshooting flow charts. Simple thing just to confirm if this issue is actually related to IPv6 only migration or is just something else. And we maintaining known issues page. So both users and tech support could go there, check first, oh, maybe it's something we already know about. Here is your workaround. Go and use dual stack. If it's something new, please report it so we can work on it. So yeah, this was actually much better than I even expected. So lessons learned. What we learned from this. First of all, please tell your tech support never, never tell users disable IPv6 as a workaround. Because it happened before, and users happily uh, read the instructions oh, if something doesn't work, just turn off IPv4. They do this, they go away, 
and they never turn it back, right? So one day you turn off IPv4, and the device just falls off the network because there is no way to find those devices and re-enable them. This is a very bad idea, right? You can do it for troubleshooting, but the last step should be please re-enable it back. Never, because we, we did find a number of laptops when users just had IPv6 disabled, and then they could not connect. So, I keep saying that what we were getting before was not actually an IPv6 operational experience, sorry. We were operating dual steps. You really start getting operating IPv6 network when there is no IPv4 to hide all those issues from you. Because actually this presentation should have, should have another 30 slides with all these various funny bugs we discovered, but then I guess I would need another three hours to tell you all those four stories, so maybe next time. But obviously, we found a lot of interesting network issues. Some of them were network bug, uh, vendor bugs, obviously. By the way, you know that, for example, some platforms are happily sending very rarely packets from duplicated IPv6 address. As a result, this happily staying VRP master, despite not being able to send or receive any v 6 packets. So anyway, also, if we found interesting corner cases in the protocol itself, right? So in Gcash init draft just cleared working group last call. So it was one of the examples of the issue which has been, there, has been there all the time, but nobody noticed until we turned off before. And obviously, yeah, all these vendor bugs and broken V6 things uh, became much more visible when we turned off before. Also, there are process issues. This is I see the first operations mindset. Operations people normally, when they verify the connectivity, what they do, they ping over V4. Normally, they don't even bother to uh, verify V6 because ah, V4 is working, that's fine, right? This is going away because now they immediately see impact if V6 doesn't work. Also, we find out that there are a lot of designs which might claim IPv6 support, but they might have some underlying IPv4 dependencies nobody even been considering. And again, those kind of issues be, uh, become very visible. So it was actually a good thing, but you need to keep it in mind that KPI both mask all that stuff. It, you might not even expect it. So early adopters, it was very good idea to start with opt-in because as a result, you get technical people who care and try to villain uh, and I'm willing to try IPv6 only and report the issues, which would allow you to find the maximum number of issues with minimal user impact, without affecting non-technical people who do not care. So IPv6 only support requirements. We also found that we have not been clear enough in our requirements for equipment and software, because sometimes you just tell, I need your system to support IPv6, and the vendor would read that I, I can assign the IPv6 address on the interface, maybe even just in local one, and that's fine. No, you need to explicitly tell, I want RDNSS, because without RDNSS, you wouldn't be able to get DNS64, right? You need management over V6. You need 464X swap for CPs and so on. So, the main point, why I believe that dedicated SSID idea, dedicated network is not a good idea. First of all, we found a lot of issues with naming. If our primary SSID called guest, how shall you name this fallback SSID? It should be less attractive that people do not connect there by default, but still attractive enough that people would connect it if primary one doesn't work. Naming is hard. So also, quite often, people do not even care what SSID they connected to. They can they just connect to something and it works. Also, device might have, might kind of might start switching between different SSIDs and you don't know again which one would be preferred. And once the device re remembers SSID, there is no way back, right? So users would uh, use it maybe accidentally. So we actually consider stop broadcasting the fallback SSID, which would still let users who need it uh, ability to use it, but they would not be connected, connected by default. And the third issue is, especially for wired networks, it doesn't scale. 
we cannot double number of VLANs uh, for dual stack and V6 only devices. So what I really want is to have V6 only and IPv4 enabled device coexist on the same network segment. And hence, uh, DHCP draft, which is currently, I think, with ISG, suggesting the mechanism to uh, for host and DHCP server to talk to each other, and uh, DHCP before would work only for devices who really need it, and devices who are capable of being V6 only would just stay V6 only on the same network segment. So. The current status of all of this, I wish I could say all offices now have V6 only guest network, but I think we're still a couple of weeks away from this. But so anytime you Sorry. I mean, you can stay here, but it'll probably be irritating. No, no, it's all good. I, I, um, we have a yeah, so we basically almost done with migrating all our offices into V6 only guest network. So I think I might be slightly over time, but I hope we might have uh, some time for questions. No question. Shall I stop sharing? Yep. How can I do this? Oop. Good. Okay. So. This is Warren. I did do a plus Q, but I guess I'll just jump in. Um, Doug Montgomery ah. had earlier asked, uh, would this working group consider hosting a living document of applications slash systems that have identified issues operating in a V6 only environment? A community effort here would be useful. So basically, you know, do we want a wiki of things that work and don't? Uh, I actually started turning up a wiki on my side for this. I, unfortunately, I was hoping I could share a link, but I just haven't done it yet. Yeah, I. There are like there are two kinds of things. Some things just do uh, do not work. Some things have workarounds. For example, Tor browser. As far as I know, there is a workaround you need to explicitly configure, but it works. So yeah, I think we need to document it there. I'm not sure if it's going to be living document or not. I'm. Mm. for the unshare uh yeah i'm trying to click on stop sharing and it does not happen in i uh how can I stop sharing? I think there's something at the very top, uh, kind of a tab that says sharing. Yes, and I click on it and, okay, I think what I can do, I can just, what's gonna happen if I do this? Okay, let me, Okay, does not, uh, okay, you know what? If I am done, I might just do this. I'll be back. Okay. Okay, thank you to Jen and Absencia. And Jordi, I think you're up next.
Am I on mute? No, I'm not. No, oh, okay, I guess I was on mute. Um, Chong Fen, could you share your slides and start? Okay. Hello, uh, can you see the slides? It's waiting for you. Can you see, see the slides? Yes, we can see the slides. Okay. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased and, and happy to have this opportunity to share uh, something about MDVC's development and the current status of China Telecom and China. Mm. <clears throat> Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, first, as about the uh, activist status of China Telecom, uh, I also uh, wrote a draft about uh, um, about the activist development of China Telecom uh, to support this uh, presentation. I hope you can uh, review it if you have uh, if you are interested in it. Uh, first, about uh, uh, the introduction of about of China Telecom. Uh, China Telecom is one of the three major operators in China, and uh, the other two is China Un Unicom and China Mobile. Uh, China Telecom is an integrated information service provider. It provides voice, well nine mobile broadband, video, these nine, and uh, VPN cloud, SET service, etc. And uh, the service coverage area uh, includes all the province regions of China and also provides service. Uh, service in some foreign regions, uh, for example, North America, Europe, and Australia, etc. And right now, the quality of users is as follows. Uh, there are about uh, 163 million uh, household users, and uh, the, the number of mobile users is about 308 million, which including uh, 200 LTE 4G mobile users. The architecture of the IP infrastructure of China Telecom. Uh, the IP network of China Telecom is a multiple AS system, just some, some, and uh, it includes uh, backbones, metro network, and the 4G, uh, 4G, 5G mobile calls, and the IDC clouds. There are two backbones, uh, ChinaNet and Sin2. Both of them are nationwide. Uh, uh, Backbone network. Uh, ChannelNet is a uh, native IP. Right now, it supports IPv4 and IPv6 dual stack network. Uh, ChannelNet mainly focuses on to provide services for uh, provide a service such as internet, uh, mobile internet, etc. Uh, different from uh, from ChannelNet, Sin2 is a MPS based network. It is also uh, IPv4 and IPv6 dual stack. It mainly focus on enterprise users to provide VPN service and some uh, or some uh, or quality sensitive service such as VoIP and high speed interconnection um, uh, among IDCs and uh, also metro network and IP run for 4, 4G 5G mobile call and the uh, uh, IDCs are connected to the two backbones. So, uh, the IPv IPv6 work of China Telecom can trace back to uh, 2002 by testing IPv6 in Hunan province. In uh, Hunan province, and we successfully uh, deploy IPv6 in ADSL network then. But now it is, ADSL has va nearly vanished in China, and replaced by optical access. And then we joined the Xinjiang project of China in 2003. Um, <clears throat> Then in 2012, and uh, the field trial in Metro Network was conducted to evaluate the tra different transition mechanisms, which is nearly in parallel with the standardization process in ITF. In, 
In 2015, IPv6 was uh, deployed successfully in uh, 4G mobile networks of two provinces, Hunan and Jiangsu province, thanks to the well support IPv6 in EPC and the mobile phones. Then when the IPv6 action plan was changed was not in November to, uh, 2017, a comprehensive IPv6 deployment started in all networks, for example, Metro, Mobile, Backbones, IDC, Clouds, uh, etc. So MetroNet was a primary scenario to implement transition. I remember that uh, in 2012, a wide variety of transition mechanisms was ev evaluated in the field trail. Uh, and uh, it took us a lot of time to compare and evaluate DISNIGHT, uh, 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 stack DISNIGHT, IVI, and uh, MAPT, MAPE, et cetera. And, uh, you want to support multiple transition mechanisms. The support system was also upgraded to adapt to different uh, transition mechanisms based on the capability of a CPE and, uh, and the availability of the resources in the network. However, due to the fact that most transition mechanisms do not gain support in CPE, so the dual stack was later adopted as the main approach for metro networks. Since 2017, all the BNGs in 218 metro networks have been upgraded to provide IPv6 access to household enterprise users in 31 provinces. Uh, right now, uh, about 44% of the household users are IPv6 capable, in which 24.6 uh, uh, million users are active, and uh, the rate is about 51%. Uh, Different from uh, metro network and the IPv6 deployment in mobile network is more straightforward. Uh, this work began in LTE uh, in 2015, and uh, we only uh, we only switch on the IPv6 capability in the user planes of EPCs. And then each user was allocated with one slash 64 prefix of IPv6, IPv6 and IPv4 address simultaneously. And uh, it should be noted that uh, EPC equipment, EPC of China Telecom is constructed on a provincial basis, which means that uh, there are 31 uh, EPC networks in, Ch in China Telecom. So for a given province where IPv6 capability is enabled, every user from each province can get IPv6 address, and that's the, it does not support IPv6. Since IPv6 has good support in, uh, in mobile phone of, of LTE, so IP, IPv6 penetration rate a mobile is higher than that of well known users. Uh, right now, there are about uh, 230.7 million online users, and the penetration rate is about 80%, of which there are about uh, 160 million uh, active users. So the penetration rate is about 60%. Uh, data center is also an important place to provide broadband service for enterprise users. So right now, about uh, 450 IDCs uh, are IPv6 enabled, which means that all the IDCs are IPv6 enabled. So this is a, uh, uh, this is a basic uh, foundation for, for IPv6 services. Uh, in addition, uh, because China Telecom also provides cloud based computing service to users. So we upgrade the computing platform to support IPv6. And right now there are more than 50 IPv6 enabled cloud products, uh, such as um, ECS, uh, GPU, and uh, load balance, VPC, uh, et cetera. So with these capabilities, uh, cloud users can provide IPv6 services. Uh, this is about IPv6 traffic, and uh, right now the IPv6 traffic uh, increased rapidly. Uh, from the figure, from the last figure, we can see that the traffic in the well known network uh, has reached one terabit per second, and uh, the traffic in mobile network is about uh, 500 gigabits per second. 
so which means that the traffic in the well network is much uh, much higher than that in mobile network in mobile network but uh, but the traffic in, uh, uh, rate in well network is now is only about two percent and the traffic rate in mobile network is a uh, is, uh, is higher than that in Wayland, it's about uh, 10%. And the traffic in mobile network is increased rapidly. We are concerned about, we are very concerned about IPv6 usage in service system. Uh, here, uh, give some uh, data about IPv support in uh, Alibaba's uh, apps. From here, we can say that uh, Many popular apps of Alibaba are supporting IPv6 in China. Uh, for example, uh, regarding the IPv6 traffic issue, Youku, which is one of the largest uh, video service platform, uh, the traffic IPv6 traffic ratio has reached 92%, which means that uh, uh, only 8% of the video is carried uh, over IPv4. And uh, uh, the second apps, which means uh, which is about Elma, which is about uh, sixty-five percent the traffic ratio, and the Golden Map, which is very popular in China for navigation, the traffic ratio is a uh, IPv traffic ratio is fifty percent. Uh, and uh, um, Alipay, which is very popular for uh, for e payment, is a very popular e payment uh, app in China, and the uh, IPv6 monthly active user ratio is 90%, which means that 90% uh, in China uh, have uh, used uh, Alipay by IPv6 uh, within one month, or at least uh, at least once in China. And uh, Taobao and Tianmao, uh, which is also very popular in China, also has uh, not uh, used, begun to use IPv6. So right now, Alibaba Group server uh, server has more than uh, 500 million monthly active users around the world. And uh, China Telecom also um, also uh, test the apps IPv6 support by other apps. Uh, from here, we can see that uh, um, IPv6 has been widely uh, utilized in some apps. Uh, the first one is TDM uh, mobile reading. The IPv6 ratio is 89%. And the Dianping, Dadong Dianping is a very popular app to order food, which is about 85% uh, of the IPv6 ratio. And uh, Xinhan Wei is very popular in China, and uh, IPv6, the ratio of IPv6 traffic is uh, 60%. And WeChat, which may be the most popular social apps uh, uh, in the world, and uh, the IP ratio is uh, 40 percent. 40 percent. This data was collected from 40 network of Hubei province. So although we have made so, a so you can, okay. let me get a word in edgewise here. Uh, we have a question in the chat. I think it's actually from two slides back. Uh, you mentioned 90%. Mm -hmm. uh, is that 90% of IPv6 enabled users or provinces, or is it of all users? 90%. Uh, uh, all the mobile users, all the mobile users, 90%. Okay, thank you. Okay. So we still face some challenges. The major challenge is how to further improve IPv6 usage and make IPv6 uh, uh, ecosystem much better. That's very important. For example, the first one is uh, the no IPv6, uh, IPv6 support in home, home router CPE, because a portion of home CPU router in China do not, that do not support IPv6, which influences the penetration rate and uh, IPv6 traffic. And uh, users can buy the CPU router from the market freely and uh, install it at home without any uh, permit from operators. However, uh, some good news that the, after realizing this problem, the IPv6 community has jointly pushed the vendors of CPU router to improve IPv support in their products. 
The second challenge is the slow transition on comments and service side. Uh, this may be an older topic. Uh, I think that one reason for the content service provider is that uh, the service layer, uh, layer transition depends on the user's on the IPv's capability of a low layer uh, network such as CDNs and IDCs, and they are required to support IPv6 in advance. The second reason maybe is Content provide a very concern about the end-to-end -end performance of the IP networks, it's especially in China, it's such a large country. So, uh, even uh, so, even though IPv6 has been implemented in the products, they are still very cautious to switch from IPv4 to IPv6 the client software. Uh, for example, WeChat. I know that WeChat has supported IPv6, but uh, they um, they increase the scope of IPv. Uh, the, this increase the scope of IPv6 users step by step based on their test. Uh, however, we are, we are still um, IPv6 has been utilized, uh, utilized in other new scenarios with the uh, development of the uh, new digital uh, era. For example, IPv6 can be used in IoT. Uh, I think this is a very important uh, scenario. 5G, V2X, and the network cloud convergence, convergence, etc. And also, as I have mentioned in uh, IET 106 meetings in Singapore, we have uh, conducted the SRV6 field trail in several uh, scenarios. For example, metro networks, metro the new, we conduct, uh, we uh, design new network, a new metro network architecture with SRV6. And the mobile transport networks and anti DDoS, uh, anti -DDoS system, etc. And uh, this work is uh, is going on. And uh, the th the third one is about um, uh, the network migration in the future. Right now, with uh, we have a, a large scale dual stack network system, we need to consider how to uh, move to IPv6 only. As Jane has mentioned, yeah, I think that IPv6 only will be very important in the future. So we need to uh, in order to reduce the keypacks and the OPEX and make the network more concise and secure. So that's a, a very important aspect of uh, IPv6. This is about IPv6 uh, uh, of China Telecom. Then the second one is uh, IPv6, uh, IPv6 status of China. Firstly, I want to talk about the IPv6 action plan of China. Uh, in, in November 2017, uh, the CPC General Office and the State General Office of China jointly issued the Large Scale IPv6 Deployment Action Plan. Uh, here, CPC means China, Chinese Communist Party. Uh, this is a very important event for the IPv6 development in China. So, with this policy, the government required all the operators and uh, all the major Content service providers such as Alibaba and uh, uh, Tencent, and uh, all the major content and cloud providers uh, are required to, su to support and uh, enable IPv6 in their network or service system. So this work has been lasted for more than two years. And the action plan action plans is composed of three steps. The first step is that by the end of uh, 2018, the active user will reach 200 million and the penetration rate will be about 20%. The second phase, by the end of 2020, and the active, active, active user will reach uh, 500 million and the uh, IPv6 penetration rate will about uh, reach 50%. And by the end of 2020, there will be no private address usage in new network. And uh, in the third step, by the end of 20, uh, 2025, uh, China will set up the largest IP infra IPv6 infrastructure in terms of IPv6 user security and IPv6 traffic. So this is an article, it is very challenging. In order to support IPv6 de uh, deployment in, in China, uh, the, CAICT, which means Chinese, uh, Chinese Academy of Information and Communication Technology, CAICT uh, developed a national IPv6 development monitoring platform. 
which is also a distributed system. And with this platform, and uh, with this platform, we can uh, monitor the network performance from end to end uh, performance and uh, monitor the IPv6 capability of the website, major website, uh, including some um, a website of the government and the large enterprise, monitor the apps and uh, also test the UE and the CPE equipment. And also with this system, system can display the latest information about the network uh, information about IPv6 development. For example, the network transition, uh, user quantities, traffic volume, CD, cloud, apps, terminal, et cetera. Uh, so um, this work is due, and this is, has, has run for, for more than one year. It is still up being updated uh, based on new requirements. So how does this platform uh, measure IPv6? You want to get the IPv6 user's, uh, user's number. Uh, the system periodically sample user uh, access logs from China's top, uh, top 30 apps. Of course, uh, users' privacy are protected in this process. In this process. And um, user traffic data is directly um, obtained from the network or carrier network operators uh, OEM system uh, or system, so which means that all the data are collected from inside of the network, not from outside. So IPv6 performance is measured through the agents deployed in the full network. And also the, there's some uh, software from user side by issue one way and round trip pin, TC pin, HTTP and streaming uh, access to measure the network performance and to end the performance. And also, uh, we develop some kind of uh, crown or special apps which can uh, be installed to uh, for Android to detect the IPv6 IPv6 uh, eligibility detection website apps IPv6 support detection for keep links and the reach IPv6 traffic. Of course, because uh, of course there's a lab which tests. Uh, it, test the mobile UE and the CPEs to verify IPv6 support and uh, whether they can get IPv6 address or the performance. Here is about uh, the, uh, the number of users. Uh, by, by June to, uh, 2020, the quantity of IPv6 capable users has reached 1.33 billion, 1.3 billion. And there are about 1.15 billion IPv4 4G users, and the penetration rate is uh, uh, 90 percent. This is uh, a penetration rate in mobile network. And of course, of course, we are concerned about active IPv6 user. The active here means that uh, the user has at least once visit of the service by IPv6 at least once within one month. So right now the the total, the total number of the active app users is about 370.8 million with a penetration rate of 37.2% uh, because right now the, the, the Chinese in China, the internet population is 554 million. Uh, from, uh, from this graph, we can see that the, from, uh, graph, from this figure, we can see that the Quality of apps increase uh, uh, gradually, gradually. And this is about the traffic, uh, traffic uh, by June 2000, uh, 2020. Right now, the uh, in metro network is the inbound, inbound traffic from, from server side to user. The inbound traffic is uh, about 4.45 terabits, uh, terabits per second, and then increased by 165% then January, 2020. And uh, in LTE mobile network, the inbound traffic is 4.16 terabits and increased by 151% in January 20, uh, 2020. And the traffic uh, between operators about 190.87 uh, gigabits. And the international traffic is 72, which is much lower than in domestic traffic. So from the figure, we can see that uh, the traffic increased uh, gradually 
during the uh, during the last uh, uh, half year. But right now, the overall ratio of IPv6 traffic is still less than 10%. So this is still no. So uh, there's still more space for IPv6 de uh, development. So, uh, okay. <coughs> Tong Fen, uh, okay. David Song has a question in the chat room. He wants clarification on the IPv6 MAU ration apps of Alibaba. Uh, oh, okay. Davy, uh, maybe you want to enable yourself to speak and uh, get into that question. David, what's your question? He writes in the chat, I would like to ask the floor oh. with, for clarification on the IPv6 MAU ration apps of Alibaba. Oh, um, you. Sorry. This data was provided by Alibaba. <laughs> so what's your problem, David? What's your question? Sorry. <clears throat> I, I can't see the question. Can someone tell me the question? Well, what he wrote is he wants clarification on the IPv6 MAU ration apps of Alibaba. So uh, and I'm sure he means ratio, not ration. He's probably being uh, spell checked. Um, what does the acronym MAU stand for? MAU uh, stands for uh, monthly active users. Monthly, monthly active, active users. users. Yeah. Because we are concerned, uh, because we think that uh, uh, active user number should deserve more attention than uh, than the number of users who only acted uh, be allocated IPv6 address. Um, may I? Because, can you hear me? This is yeah. David. Oh, okay. okay. I just muted myself. I'm sorry. Uh, I just want to uh, make a clarification that. Uh, the IPv6 MAU ratio is, is not as same as the traffic ratio because the uh, in the traffic ratio the, the the part of IPv6 plus the IPv4 equals one right equals to one hundred percent, but the MAU ratio is not as exactly the same because if you if you count the IPv6 uh, users in one month active for once, they, they may they may active many times in the month. In IPv4 appears uh, in IPv4 networks, so the the ratio of IPv6 is plus IPv4 don't equals to uh, 100 percent. For example, for the Alipay, there are, we 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 count to the 90 percent of the IPv6 MAU, uh, but mm -hmm. actually the IPv uh, the IPv4 users may may the 100%. MAU may be the 100 percent. Yeah, yes. I, I just want to make that clarification. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, I interrupted you, Changfen. Please continue. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mm. And Fred asked me to make some comparison of the measurement with APNIC and uh, Akamai. Uh, this is a measurement of, uh, from APNIC. From here, we can see that 18% uh, uh, of the uh, users are IPv6 capable in China, uh, only 8%, which is less than that of the measurements in China. Uh, this is a measurement of, uh, from Archimed, which shows the, the ratio of IPv6 enabled web browsers, uh, which shows that 15% uh, of the web browsers are pv6 uh, uh, capable uh, so so i will uh yes there's some difference between measurements <laughs> so i give a short summary uh due to joint efforts ipv6 had gained wide deployment in china and it became a, a universal capability in the ip infrastructure uh further improving the traffic uh by the transition of content service and uh, improve the IPv6 web 
will be essential for build your fatty physics system. That's a major challenge. And uh, along with development, new digital area IPv6 will be used in scenarios uh, such as 5G, OT, and network cloud convergence, and then the flex. So in combination with SRV6, IPv6 only, or IPv6 centric will be the right way to be the path of future migration. So I think it is important for us to consider the or to consider designing uh, IPv6 uh, network architecture in the future, um, which can be helpful for large scale network transition. Uh, I'm done. Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, questions? Uh, Paolo, you, you want to ask your question, Vox? Okay, so can you... Yes, my, my question is about uh, IPv6 versus IPv4 performance. If you have ever test or measurement just to see whether one is faster than the other in terms of latency. Thanks. Uh, right now, we have done some errors and uh, um, in most uh, province of China, the province of the performance uh, similar to IPv4, but in some province, uh, the IPv4 performance is uh, lower than uh, IPv uh, than IPv4, so we are concerned about this by uh, the network equipment and the optimize the routing, etc., uh, which is essential for for IPv6 in development in China Telecom. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what question. Sure, thanks. Many thanks. And I also know the um, uh, apps, for example, uh, Alibaba and uh, some apps of Alibaba and, uh, um, and Tencent. They, they have also done some uh, measurement of the network performance, uh, the PV6 performance, and make some comparison uh, between and IPv6. And uh, so I think this work will be also helpful to improve the uh, IPv6 in the future. About the uh, um, difference of environment of uh, uh, between uh, China and uh, and APNIC. Actually, this uh, I have talked this with uh, Chief Houston uh, for a long time about this issue, uh, and uh, he told me that the measurement of APNIC is based on ads, uh, as some kind of uh, ads based uh, measurement. So, uh, so this is a so th this is a. I think that uh, uh, the the difference mainly due to the different methodology, as uh, as uh, Fred has mentioned. First, the uh, the, AP, the measurement APNIC is done from outside of the network, and uh, it is a S based measurement. So, S based measurement approach suffers from measurement bias, which means that uh, uh, the ad placement is in proportion to users population. Uh, so, which means that, uh, mm, which means that uh, it's some kind of compensation mechanisms of the population of the user data, but uh, 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 as far as I know, they cannot get this kind of data, so they cannot do some this kind of compensation. And uh, another issue is that um, 
the measurements rely on the web browser. But uh, uh, today, most uh, users mainly use apps instead of browser to access service. So there is possibility the measurement result is not consistent with the reality. The measurement of challenge based on the connection of data sample from instead the network or service platform. The result may be more accurate. However, we still think. Uh, however, we still think that the measurement API is very is a, is a great system. They have done good, good job. So we respect the measurement API um, and uh, which are very helpful for us to analyze and the work. And uh, certainly, I don't think the difference is related to some kind of filtering. I have done lots of tests. Uh, uh, my colleagues distribute in different province. Give province um, job test, and uh, it seems that most of the measurement communication were normal. Uh, there is no sign of that the measurement data has been filtered or during the transition during the, the transition. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, yeah, I have one. Uh, on many of your slides, we have seen that your number of users, APV6 users, is already very impressive. It's very high number, 60%, 80%, it's very good number. But uh, for traffic, it's still 15%, 10%. Different slide, different percentage, depends on fixed broadband, mobile broadband. But but anyway, the percentage of traffic is much smaller than percentage of user. Why? Uh, as I have mentioned, uh, um... There are many apps and uh, in China, many are the big apps, large scale apps in China. They have been not, uh, uh, they have been not IPv6 enabled. Uh, maybe they have only provide IPv6 in a small area, not the whole, not in the whole China. So uh, we need to, uh, we need to push forward, push them to uh, enable IPv6 in the service platform to support IPv6. Uh, to enable IPv6 in their client software to support to be IPv6 capable. That's the, I think that's a major reason. Okay, thanks. It's application problem. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, we can see that the traffic increased rapidly. I think that space for the tracks uh, for the traffic increase in the future uh, in the near future. Thank you. Other questions? Um, Any other questions? Yeah. Who who was it that asked that question? Warren needs that. Sorry. The, the question that you just answered that. Um, oh, it's Edward. Okay. Yeah. Last one. Yeah. Last one from me. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um. So, are there any further questions? Failing that. Okay, go, go ahead, ahead. please. Jonathan, go ahead. Okay, uh, if, if you have any if, um, more questions, you can uh, ask me by email. Um, okay, or, or, or talk uh, with me offline. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thank and you. Now, now, Jordy has asked for a few minutes to talk about uh, uh, to talk about the four six four XLAT stuff. Um, Jordy, you want to um, Chung Fan? I need for you to stop sharing. Uh, Jordy, do you want to get in here? Yeah. Uh, let me start sharing when I can. I don't see the start sharing thing. Where is it? I have used it many times, but I, I don't see it now. Well, I think Chong Fin needs to stop sharing oh, okay. first. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, great. So, Jordi, you should be able to share now. I am trying, but I don't see the sharing thing. It should be in the three dots or where? I did many um, times, but I cannot find it right now. I think it's up at the top of the screen. The Mac, it's on the bottom next to the camera icon between the camera and the, the, camera. the second oh, person. Yes, I see it now. Sorry. I am confused with so many different conferencing applications. I think you should be able to see it now. Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, so quick, quick uh, remember about uh, this draft. Uh, we are right now in version two, which has been published about five days ago, I think. Uh, uh, the basic, uh, the basic problem statement is that when we are using NAT46, and that happens both in MAPT and 464x LAT. Uh, if you have IPv4 only devices, uh, for example, uh, smart TVs or set top boxes, uh, their connections to the CDNs uh, are going to be uh, naturally terminated in IPv4, which means that you are forcing two translations one at the CPE uh, from IPv4 to IPv6, and again, another translation at the NAS64. That means, uh, of course, a lot of extra utilization of the NAT64, which we believe is useless and in many cases, maybe a show stopper for deploying IPv6 only solutions. Uh, there is an equivalent situation when you have IPv4 only CGNs, uh, but in that case, the CDNs are typically accepting uh, via um, di direct peerings, uh, like communities or other ways, uh, private addresses from the ISP network. So in that case, this is solved. Uh, so just to to show how how it happens, let's let's think this is a, a typical 464x LAT deployment where you have uh, here the user dual stack LANs. Uh, you have the CPE, which has the NAT46. Uh, then we have an IPv6 only access to the ISP. We have the NAT64 that allows accessing IPv4 devices. Uh, you have also, of course, the DNS or DNS64 or bot. And uh, then you have uh, other networks which are IPv6 enabled, right? So if the devices inside the user lands are ipv6 capable we will have this green line end to end uh ipv6 to the to the dual stack cdns okay so it's clear that this is very optimized but if you have any ipv4 only uh, a smart tv the traffic flow in this case will be ipv4 to the cpe translated in the CPE, translated again in the NAT64, and then we will reach the IPv4N of the CDNs, even if the CDNs are dual stack, okay? So what we try to avoid is, if the CDNs are already dual stack, why we need to translate here again, if we have already here IPv6 translation, okay? So this will be the optimal situation. We have still the IPv4 only device like a smart TV or set top box, uh, which for whatever reason cannot be updated or it's too old or whatever. Uh, we do the translation in the CP exactly the same as what we do today with 464 xlat and, and MAPT, but we want to be able to keep that translation instead of going through the NAS64 to reach the IPv6 site of the dual stack CDN. That's the goal, that's the optimization, okay? Uh, now, we have described in the document three basic approaches. The first one is trying to do the same as what is done in CGNs with IPv4. But in the case of IPv6, that will mean that the interfaces of the CDNs, uh, they configure 
the same prefix, in this case, the well-known prefix of the NAT64 that the ISP is using. Okay, so most of the CDNs, when we talk it to them, they said, we cannot do that. Uh, some they may be able to do, but most of them not. Okay, so this seems like a non-possible approach, at least not covering uh, most of the, 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 the big CDNs. The approach two is uh, because the 464 xlat and MAPT require that the uh, CP has also a DNS proxy, we could do a static mapping, what is called explicit address mapping uh, table for the uh, A records with the quad A records uh, um, in the CP. That will mean that the CDN don't need to change anything. And what we are trying to do is to make this uh, happen magically. And of course, the goal is to avoid any uh, breakage in, in uh, any other kind of service or application or whatever. Uh, and the approach, let me jump to approach uh, three. Uh, the approach three is doing the same, but creating this explicit uh, automated, uh, uh, sorry, explicit uh, address mapping table uh, by means of a manual configuration from the uh, ISP, okay? But this again will need a lot of coordination with the with the CDNs, and it seems not so easy as well as like the the first approach I mentioned. So, uh, what happened in the last few days is that uh, the document passed the last call, but it seems that many people missed that. So Jen was assigned as chefer for the document. Uh, she provided a lot of very useful uh, inputs. Uh, at the beginning, most of them were basically many editorial comments or clarifications in the text. Uh, this is the, the actual version that we have, version two. And uh, after that, um, there were some additional discussion in the mailing list. There, there are further comments from Jen, from Eric, from uh, Bas uh, Basilenko, and uh, also from Eric Klein. Uh, and what, what I am missing, because those comments come yesterday and before yesterday, and I didn't have enough time to, to tackle that in a new version for today, but the, the, what I am going to do is, I, I guess it don't make sense to, to keep the document in last call. I, I guess it is clear that it needs to, to, to go into another round of discussion, and then if necessary, we, we, we can call again for a, a new last call. But uh, there are some points like ensuring that no breach, breakage is generated, uh, security issues regarding DNS and others. Uh, there are comments, I think, from Eric uh, Nigren about cl clients catching and TTLs that I need to review and some other comments. I didn't want to make a full list of them, uh, but the, the, the motivation of this presentation, of course, is for other people to please read the document, provide inputs. Uh, if you have a better idea about how to optimize this, uh, let us know. Uh, and let's let's uh, keep discussing it for for uh, for a new version. Um, I think uh, in in the next two three days I could have a new version with all the comments that I have received. But if I get if I keep going other inputs, I will wait for all of them to come before publishing a, a new version. And I think uh, that's it for for this part of the document. And as part of this discussion, we have another related discussion that that uh, actually was among Jen, the chairs and myself, which is uh, we know that clearly uh, 464xLAT uh, is the uh, transition mechanism that have more subscribers, okay? Uh, however, it's the only transition mechanism which is not in the standard track. It's an informational document. So I was thinking that if we pass the last call of the optimization, we can actually consider going into a standard track. But because we are delaying this until we have a better solution or a better wording for all the document and so on, I still think that a parallel activity or a parallel work could be getting 464xLAT uh, moving to a standard. Uh, 
Uh, I think some people may agree with this. Uh, I think Jen told me, yes, we should do that. It's clear. Uh, other people uh, in the other round of discussion that we have about this tell me the same. Um, but I have also the, the question, the open question about if this is something that could be done in basic ops, because I believe, if I recall correctly, that was done in Behave, but Behave no longer exists, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So open discussion on that and, and also inputs to, to the optimization, please. Thank you. Okay, related to this topic, uh... 464 XLAT was actually put forward as a uh, as an operational way to use uh, stateless and stateful translation. Uh, so the document was produced in V6Ops as, a, okay. as an operational document, and it's it's informational <laughs> because V6Ops isn't allowed to produce standards. Um, so I will have to talk to my chair or to, to my AD uh, and basically get his okay to, uh, I, to, to take it to I standard. Think, Fred, I think the main question is if we agree that that it, it don't make sense having the most used mechanism not being a standard. That's that's the first question that we, we need to make ourselves, right? And then find a way to, to do that. Um, okay, well, that's a question I'll ask on the list, um, yep. but right now, does anybody object to what uh, Jordy is proposing here? Hearing no objections, uh, I'll take it to the list and we'll see see what we get. Um, but but I would expect that yes, we can uh, ask the IESG to simply change the status of sixty eight seventy seven. Um, I don't I don't think anything need to be modified. But but uh, I I am happy to talk with the original authors and and uh, get the work done with them if we need to update anything else. Okay. We'll probably want to go through some variation on a working group last call with with that uh, to to collect comments. You know, yeah. if if people want to change sixty eight seventy seven in any way, that would be the way to collect that. Now, if you look in the chat room, there's also Warren is of the opinion um, that it should be um, that that. This document should be reviewed by DNS op. Um, I believe they're meeting next week. So I'll drop a note to the chairs and copy you and ask for a slot for you to make a presentation talking about uh, your proposal. Yeah, um, OK. OK, so. So now, now also, uh, if you look in the chat room, um, I have asked for two people to review this and post their reviews to the list. Uh, the reason being that Jen, as uh, document shepherd, is of the opinion that it hasn't had sufficient review. So can I get people, two people to review it? Uh, Edward, uh, you said in the chat room that you would be willing to, to review it. Okay, uh, fine. So please review the, the internet draft and post your review to, to V6 Ops. Can I get one more reviewer? There is, there is a couple of uh, extensive emails, one from Eric Nigerin. And the other one, I think, is well. Jen has another one as well, uh, um, which is basically about DNS spoofing, I, I believe, and other security issues. And there is also another one from Eric Klein. So I will, of course, uh, respond in the list to all those inputs. Just didn't have time in the last couple of days. 
Okay. I, I say that to avoid repeating over the, the same top topic. <laughs> right? Yeah, okay, and that's fine. Okay, well, I don't hear another volunteer to uh, to be a reviewer, but uh, uh, Jen, uh, would those emails re respond to the question that you were asking me? Fred, uh, yeah, I just uh, would like to point out, so I think the most current open issues with the document is security considerations because people have pointed out a number of very interesting attack scenarios, right? And the second issue is operation, how fragile the solution is, right? So it would be nice yeah, if we could get more people uh, yeah, reviewing it. So I think two, two should be fine, but I guess there are some open issues already on the list which haven't been addressed in zero two. So I'm just curious, so are we going to do a round, another round of last call for this? Like what's our timeline? Do we well, have to do official uh, last call or? I guess we need to have a stable version first, right? And then we can sing in the last call. But uh, I think unless there are an, a lot of new inputs, I think I can get uh, a new version uh, around next week maximum. But it depends uh, if we have more additional inputs. And it depends also if I am able to find a solution to the to the to the pos possible security problems because maybe I don't find the solution right, so I don't know so, this time. Yes, yeah, so I think you cannot post anything until twenty fifth anyway because the data tracker is blocked. Uh, so we and again I I think I posted it on the mailing list today. We like I think we might still consider if your first proposal I mean section five dot one might be actually the optimal one because it's less fragile yes it does require operators cdn operators to do something but if they already allow you to bypass cdn it's not much worse for them it's basically the same the, there is, if they no, already no. have jen i i already thought on that uh I, I i was thinking this morning on the paper during two hours this this morning on this and the, the there is a big difference in the case of uh, IPv4 CGN, the operators don't need to have different addresses for the services in their interfaces. Okay? But in IPv6, they will need to add new DNS records, yeah. addresses to the interfaces to match the well known prefix mm -hmm. from the operator. So there is a. a, a it's a small, but it's a lot of additional work. It can be probably automated, but CDN providers told me we don't want to do this. If they change their mind, I am really happy. Okay. Okay, so this WebEx session is scheduled to end in about a minute and a half. Um, so question does anybody else have anything to bring up in the very short remaining time let's keep working in the list then yeah let's take this to the list and uh jen I, you can expect probably a working group last call sometime in august but uh we'll, we'll need to get an updated draft and some some comments on it first Thanks. Thanks thank for doing much. this, yeah. Okay. Well, <clears throat> and thank thank you to all the people that attended. Uh, I think at our peak we were around seventy people this morning. Right now we have forty one. Um, so I'll be sending out the uh, the link to the recording, and it, it, you can look for that on the list. Um, so we're done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Bye. 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 Bye.